I'm Sean Haney, and this is Real Ag on the Weekend. Let's get real and get connected with the week that was in Canadian agriculture. Real Ag on the Weekend starts now. Welcome, everybody, to Real Egg on the Weekend. I'm your host, Sean Haney. It's a pleasure to be with you here again on this Saturday. Really looking forward to wrapping up the week that was. We've got two big conversations for you. Very timely, I guess. And, and, you know, topics that I know that are probably on your mind and you've been thinking about. One has to do with the markets. And this week, Lindsay Smith of Real Agriculture, one of my colleagues, had a chance to talk to Neil Townsend. He is with FarmLink Marketing Solutions and Grain Fox. So they're going to have a chat about the markets as we are about to, well, we're getting closer to spring, although it feels a, just a, a little bit further away than normal because of just some snow on the ground and, and really some chill in the air for the most part. We're also going to hear today from Jason Lenz. Now, he is the chair of the Can- Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Crops. He's a farmer from Bentley, Alberta. Now, you remember going back a few years, Responsible Grain, the Code of Practice? It, it, it got a pretty... There was a big debate about it. I was going to say a negative reaction, but there were some farmers that were for it. And, and there were a lot that were very concerned about the prescriptive nature of what that code of practice would entail and how much of it was a a dictation of you shall do this versus recognizing a lot of the good work that farmers were already doing. Well, they have, they released a white paper uh, now, probably uh, that's a while ago now, but this is now code 2.0, so to speak. They feel that they've listened to farmers feedback and now they have a version that is, uh, people are going to be a little bit more receptive to, to consider. So we're going to hear from Jason Lenz because he talked to Kelvin Hepner of Real Agriculture. So we're going to play that audio for you here today as well. If you have any feedback on today's show, you can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com or call the Real Ag feedback line, 855-776-6147. Well, let's get to some of that conversation with Jason Lenz of the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Crops. He talked to Real Agriculture's Kelvin Hepner. Here it is. So there was certainly a lot of feedback and discussion, debate about uh, that original code of practice proposal, that draft uh, a couple of years ago. Where, Where is this initiative at when it comes to uh, the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Crops and, and what you're working toward for uh, the grain sector? Yeah, well, it's certainly been... It's certainly been a long, uh, a long goal here in getting uh, something developed here, Kelvin. And um, you know, the the Canadian Roundtable for, for Sustainable Crops and, and all of our members there have really, uh, you know, we really focused on making sure that we're listening to all the feedback that we've gotten from farmers um, right from that first draft of, of the code through to now, where we've. Um, We've engaged with farmers again, and and uh, more importantly, farm grower organizations and different organizations uh, across uh, the country um, over this last year in, um, you know, getting some feedback on what the redraft of that, of the first uh, responsible grain um, document looked like. And, and, you know, we've come a long, long ways for sure. Um, you know, going back, uh, to the the fall of 2020, where um, the the white paper was developed, and and the white paper was really what we call the why document, as far as the reasons why industry and and uh, farm groups see the need to have something like this in place for our crop industry in Canada. And um, since that was uh, um, consulted on, and and uh, people had a, a good chance to look at that white paper. That's really where things flipped, and, and there's a much better appreciation and understanding why our industry needs something like this. And it's only been ramped up since then, um, not only by our government, by, by but by our green customers and consumers from around the world in that uh, Canada cannot fall behind in having something in place for our, our crop sector. And, and that's where CRSE fits in, and, and we feel like we have uh, brought farmers along the way with us to make sure we have something uh, at the end of the day that makes sense to them and is something that is usable for our industry uh, for years to come. 
Can you expand on that, Jason? The the why of of why the roundtable is working towards this for the green sector, what the reason is behind this from a, a high level. I know there might be people listening who recall hearing about responsible grain, but it, it's been a few years now. Uh, what what the idea is behind this, the, the big picture goal? Yeah, well, the, the white paper is something that came out of um, the first draft, draft of responsible grain as far as, you know, there was... There was probably a misstep by the CRSD in that uh, we we should have provided um, you know farmers and, and our crop sector with that document saying here's what we're hearing from our international customers, uh, even from our domestic grain exporters and and consumers here both in Canada and throughout the world. As far as you know, they're asking questions about how. Canada is growing these high quality crops that we do. You know, it doesn't matter if, it, if it's our our high quality CWRS wheat or our canola or malt barley, our pulses. When when we have people in the industry that go out to uh, sell our sell these commodities on trade missions and otherwise, that's the first question that they're getting is is how is Canada doing it? And and we all know, um, you know, in particular as farmers, that it's we're able to provide this high, highest quality commodities. Um, it's based on on our environment, um, our growing season. Um, it's based on our, our the farm management practice that we're doing, um, including things like no till and and um, and and the other one is really the genetics that we have here in Canada. And and um, doesn't matter what crop type, we know that we have some of the world leading genetics um, for our cereal crops and our canola and pulses. So that's really what the white paper was, was about is, is explaining to farmers and in industry that here's what industry and, and farm groups are seeing that here's the reason why we have to come up with something. So um, we can tell our story and, and a big part of that first round of consultations we heard from farmers is, the tone of the first draft was way too prescriptive. We need to do a better job of saying, "Here's how we're doing it. Um, here's the here's the real um, what sustainability uh, looks like in Canada." So, how would you say that this version, or what you're working with, or or what the goal is to put together here? How how is it different from responsible grain than for for people that were following the process a couple of years ago? Yeah, well, that's that's something that um, the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Crops has taken some pride in, in that um, we feel that we've really taken the opportunity to consult with with farmers, uh, with farm groups, and with our, our crop industry over this last year and a half in making sure we get this right. Um, the, the first draft... Um, was, was pretty prescriptive. Uh, we admit that. That so uh, we tried to cover all the bases. Um, we we're trying to cover the breadth of this country, and that it's it, it, we're in a big country here, and, and there's a lot of different cropping practices, and a lot of different uh, crops, and a lot of different regulations that's happening between different provinces here. So the the original draft included seven different modules. Uh, we've cut that down to four uh, modules, the four that we feel are, are most important. And um, and we've changed the tone of it, um, you know, kind of full 180 and saying that here here is what we're doing. Um, here is what we shouldn't do compared to what other countries in the world are doing. But here's how Canada is leading the world in, um, you know, in growing these high, high value, high quality uh, commodities that we are here on our farms. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to have more of Kelvin Hepner's discussion with Jason Lenz of the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Crops right after this quick break. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith of realagriculture.com. Join me Monday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern for The Agronomists, Canada's only live interactive agronomy-based show. Each week, we answer your most pressing questions with a rotating panel of agronomists, researchers, and extension staff from across Canada. Join me Monday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn, or head to realagriculture.com slash live at 8 p.m. Eastern. 
Hey, I'm Kelvin Hepner, and I just wanted to give you a, a heads up about a new project that we are working on here at Real Agriculture together with the Canadian Agri-Food Policy Institute, or CAPI. We're calling it the Ag Policy Connection. Stay tuned. The first episodes of the Ag Policy Connection brought to you by Real Agriculture and the Canadian Agri-Food Policy Institute. They'll be showing up here on Real Agriculture and in your podcast feed on your podcast player shortly. Welcome back to Real Ag on the weekend. We've been listening to a discussion that Kelvin Hepner of Real Agriculture had with Jason Lenz. He is the chair of the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Crops, talking about Code 2.0 and what this means for the future of a national code of practice in the grain and oil seed sector. Let's hear the rest of the conversation. At this point, you're not calling it responsible grain. You're not even calling it a, a code of practice. What is the the appropriate title to use for uh, for this initiative at uh, at this juncture? Well, we're narrowing down the, what the actual name of it should be, and we want to make sure that it is, um, you know, it's descriptive of what the, what this tool is going to be all about, and and certainly we want to focus on on um, you know all Canadian crops so um, and and the overall sustainability of our crops so we've got kind of a short list developed here from a lot of different um, suggestions from within industry and from farmers and and um, you know we want to make sure that it uh, describes what the tool is and and um, you know kind of catches the eye for any of our international customers and, and consumers that want to know what's happening on farms um, here in Canada. So we'll have that released here probably within the next month. Okay. That, that was the next question I had. What are the, the next steps and, and how can producers, how can farmers across the country, grain farmers get involved in, uh, in this process? Yeah. So, um, you know, over the last uh, probably four months here, we've really engaged with uh, primarily with our grower organizations and, and some of our industry organizations in um in the redraft of, of what this tool is going to look like. So we've been, we've really had farmers engaged across the country. Um, we've had four different sessions focused on these four main modules. And those modules are nutrient and soil management, seed varieties and crop health, water and biodiversity, and uh, finally health and wellness. And, you know, Throughout those four consultations, we've had uh, over 50, 50 participants, um, you know, providing direction for us, providing feedback, um, and it's been more than just on the wordsmithing scale. We've we've done a lot more, um, you know, looking at what's uh, looking at what the tone of the document should look like and what needs to be included as far as content. And you know, it's really hard to get away from some of the regulations that we are under um, here in Canada in the different provinces, those have to be included. Um, but we've really focused on the key messages and what some of those practices are within each module that uh, makes sense to a farmer in Alberta, um, in Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, and otherwise, because that's, that's part of the part of the design and development of this is we're trying to make sure that it fits for for all of Canada, and, and that's a pretty tall task, but um, we feel we've made significant progress, and a lot of that has to do with the help that we receive from from farmers and farm groups that we've consulted with so far. Um, and finally, Kelvin, we do have two open sessions coming up uh, shortly to, to uh, allow any from the farm, the general farm public, so you know, farmers at large that. Uh, want to continue to be involved in this process and uh, we have a list of over 600 producers that took part in the uh, original responsible grain consultation that'll be their opportunity to take a look at what we put together here in the redraft and make sure that uh, they have an opportunity to provide any feedback and and um, you know really kind of help us we feel we're at the stage where we're getting really close on that uh putting some polish on this document because we have had such a a renewed appreciation and understanding for the reasons for doing this. And um, we want to make sure that we make it available 
and are, are as transparent as possible to every farmer in Canada. What's the end goal uh, here, Jason? Or what, what does it look like if uh, if this goes ahead the way that uh, the roundtable would would like to see it? Is this like fifty percent of farmers across the country signing up and participating? Seventy, hundred? What what uh, what does this look like, and what does that mean for, as you say, the the marketing and uh, conveying that that message about Canadian agriculture? Well, I think that's uh, that's something that we see as uh, ongoing for sure, uh, Kelvin. Uh, you know, this was never viewed as being any sort of mandatory or verifiable tool. This is more that um, it was intended to be voluntary right from day one. So any farmer that sees value in this and, and contributing back to the industry uh, will have the ability to say that, yes, I, I agree with this and, and um, you know, would put their name behind it. But um you know, I think as we go down the road here and people, once we get the final document out and people can have, lay their eyes on it and say that, yeah, this, this is exactly what I do on my farm. And, and uh, I appreciate uh, the industry putting this together to help tell the story about how um, I'm growing these crops on my farm. And, you know, I think as farmers, we can all be accused of, of talking about how great um, you know the practices that we're doing and how great a job we're doing on our farm, but this can really be an education piece for for to help farmers to to help explain what they're doing on their farms to even their own families that are maybe a generation or two removed away from the farm. Um, it's definitely going to help our grain industry. You know our commodity groups that are trying to help us sell and maintain markets across the world. And, and finally, you know, I think it's something that, um, you know, we can use as, as even consumer facing when when we get faced with questions from consumers about uh, some of the practices that we're doing on our farm and why we're doing them. That, that'll that be a big component of it. And, and finally, you know, with some of the policies that our government is coming out with over the last uh, couple of years, I think this could be used as a very significant uh, educational piece for for many in government to um, who maybe haven't spent very much time on a farm in Western Canada or, or Ontario uh, or even Quebec to say that yeah this is what farmers this is the reason why farmers are doing what they're doing to raise these uh, these uh, high quality and, and safe uh, safe food for for our customers. I have to ask you, Jason, uh, there was some funding announced, initial funding to get the project off the ground from the federal government in 2020. Where Where is the funding for this coming from at uh, at this point? Yeah, so that initial funding, Kelvin, you know, we're, we're basically re- right at the, the tail end of that funding that was provided in getting this, uh, this tool developed. Um, you know, we're at the stage now, once we get the, the, this final draft, uh, somewhat approved by our CRSC uh, steering committee and, and membership, we'll be looking at putting a, you know a communication plan together. Um, you know, and that includes um, you know getting this document printed. Um, and and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep saying polished up a little bit better to uh, to make it something that's presentable. So um, we will be looking at. Uh, you know, a small amount of funding from um, from both governments and uh, from some of our membership to get that completed. And, and I believe that uh, Susie Miller has already got uh, uh, the commitment from government for the government portion of that through the new Sustainable um, Canadian Egg Partnership. We just have to get uh, final approval from our membership to cover the other cost shared part of that. So it's, it's not a whole lot, you know, it basically is going to cover printing costs and um, the communication plan, but um, we feel that that's going to be close to the final steps there. We can say that this project is complete. Um, It's something that we can be proud of something that farmers across the country can, can use and be proud of. And um, it's really, it's really going to be that storytelling tool um, or document that farmers can hold up and say, if you have questions about how and why I'm growing these crops, well, here's what I can show you. 
That was Real Agriculture's Kelvin Hepner chatting with the chair of the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Crops, Jason Lenz. He's a farmer from Bentley, Alberta. Now the feedback will begin, and uh, farmers are going to have a real opportunity to provide that feedback and, and let uh, this group know uh, how they feel about this new version. I think it's important, though, that your commentary, your feedback is not based on the last version. It is on the current version. So that, that I think is an important piece of the, the commentary to make sure that your thoughts are, are relevant to the text as currently drafted. So you're going to have definitely an opportunity to do that. I encourage you to participate whether you think it's a great idea, poor idea, or you're kind of lukewarm to it. It's very important to participate in the process. We'll be right back here on Real Ag on the Weekend right after this. Canola is more than just a pretty face in the prairie landscape. It's a big business, both here and around the world, that requires you to be informed and up-to-date on everything it takes to grow a successful crop. The Canola School on realagriculture.com has an expert library of video resources covering markets, agronomy, and more to help you grow a healthy and profitable canola crop. Visit canolaschool.com today. Brought to you by BASF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Whether you're seeding, harvesting, or anything in between, the Wheat School on realagriculture.com has you covered. Timely agronomic information from industry experts available online anytime. Give your wheat crop a good start and a great finish with the Wheat School on realagriculture.com. Brought to you by CNM Seeds, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat and Barley Commission. Welcome back to Real Ag on the weekend. If you have any feedback on anything we talk about here on the show, send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. And also encourage you to check out realagriculture.com. You're, you're listening to Real Ag on the weekend. Why not check out realagriculture.com as well? We can't squeeze everything that happened here this week in Canadian Ag into this show. So uh, we have lots of coverage of that on our website and uh, make sure you also sign up for our free e-newsletter so it's in your inbox every single morning go to realagriculture.com slash subscribe now we're going to hear about the markets and i know as we get a little bit closer to seeding and planting time you're, you're trying to figure out what to do with new crop right it, it's on your mind it's a consideration as you try to manage that margin and your profitability hopefully mother nature cooperates What's in your control is how you handle your risk management and your marketing plan. This week, Lindsay Smith of Real Agriculture had a chance to catch up with Neil Townsend. He is a market analyst with Grain Fox and Farm Lake Marketing Solutions. Neil is exceptional when it comes to the markets, uh, really in the U.S. and in Canada. Let's hear what Neil has to say. What are the markets telling us about any sort of acreage switching for the immediacy? The main thing the markets are telling us right now is like collectively sort of some bad news for farmers, right? Like the markets have kind of, they got to a point, we had a pretty strong market year in terms of prices and the price signals were pretty positive, you know, for most crops, some crops not as good. And then in the last little while, the major grains and oil seeds have sort of capitulated a little bit and started to sell off. And in the whole environment because of, you know, the macroeconomic circumstances and the geopolitics. I mean, it's just given a little bit more of an air of uncertainty and the potential for volatility. And what, of course, the farmers are fearing and the markets are fearing is sort of a negative volatility. Mm -hmm. Now, if I think about the last, let's say, week, um, and it seems strange to think it's only been a week, uh, but it has been a tumultuous little while. Uh, we've had some major banking issues, uh, not just in North America, but also with Credit Suisse in uh, in Europe. Uh, we've got, you know, China visiting Russia. Like, there's a lot going on. So is is... You know, this pullback we've seen in the markets, is that all related and how? Yeah, I mean, again, sometimes, you know, uh, grains and oil seeds, pulses, whatever, they can benefit from the whole idea like, you know, hey, the world has to eat. So they're sort of seen as like a safety asset uh, when, you know, there's so much tumult in the in the broader market. In this environment where one of the major issues, you know, uh, is inflation, and again, there were some inflation numbers out today in Canada, and the inflation was lower month on month than it was, you know, in the last reading, but, you know, the 
the area that was stubbornly high remains sort of food, right? So, uh, you know, there is this perception that food is very expensive. Of course, there's a humongous, you know, differential between like, you know, a farm product that's shipped to an elevator or exported in bulk and then like, you know, something that reaches the grocery store shelf. But definitely there is a perception that, you know, food is still expensive or, or and those commodities are still expensive. So I think in the environment of all this uncertainty and volatility, I mean, you know, people are uncertain, you know, which asset class they want to hold. And I, I mean, it's, it's really, you know, there's no right answer right now because we don't know, like, is the main concern interest rates because that seems to have capitulated these banks or is the main interest inflation. And that's sort of, you know, tends to theoretically hurt everybody, right? Mm-hmm. Now, there's there's a bit of good news, a bit of not so good news. I'm not going to call it bad news. But let's let's dig into canola a little bit here. Um, certainly not doing great um, lately. And so what what market drivers are happening here that is pulling canola prices down? Yeah, a lot of the weakness, and I mean, again, you know, some people would say that the weakness is, big picture weakness that's bearing down on it. But a lot of the specific weakness in the uh, rapeseed canola market would be coming from Europe. So the European market has been, you know, really beat down and it's sort of the lead in this situation. And what's happening in Europe is, you know, there's relatively good production potential next year, but there's a lot of uh, cheap canola or what they call rapeseed, you know, available for import, including like a record crop from Australia uh, and, you know, significant amounts pouring in from uh, from Ukraine over the border, like the land border over from Ukraine. So the market just started to, to go down. And again, like rapeseed canola in, in the European Union op- occupies a very interesting place. It's not really seen as like a human food there. So you know, weakness in crude oil, weakness in sort of a broader market would also have sort of a bearing on it. And we've seen that over the last, you know, couple of weeks as well. Now, of course, the weakness started way before crude oil kind of went in reverse, but all of those things have just meant that it's going down. Now, from a Canadian perspective, I think that the big fear is that, you know, we're going to lose out on export market share because of this abundance of, um, you know, Australian production. My only comment there was we haven't really seen evidence of that yet. The CGC numbers continue to be fairly strong week on week. The second thing that should be considered is that, you know, Australia has a finite amount of export slots. You know, you can't, they don't have a lot of ability to switch them around. And and if the market that, you know, we're talking about is seeing like, you know, an aggressive decline in prices, well, that would almost be a market that they wouldn't want to service as much as servicing another one like wheat that has had a bit more stability in it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I've certainly been hearing, you know, these rumblings of Australia finally having a crop to export and, and what impact that will have. So certainly it is top of mind. Uh, but you do mention wheat. Let's move uh If we can, we did get some recent numbers uh, on Russian production. So what do we know there? Yeah, I mean, well, it's it's good the way you phrase that because you say, you know, what do we know there? And the the answer is like, you know, there's a lot of different stories out there. What do we know? This is what we know. Like they have had a very big export program this year. There's two views on their production last year. One view is the USDA, which we usually take as sort of the, you know, the gospel when it comes to crop production and S&Ds and that type of stuff. They've got sort of like a mid-90s number or a 93 million ton production. And everybody else, like the Russians themselves and most people in the trade, have a 100 plus million ton crop. Now, there's some speculation, some of that 100 plus million might be like grain that actually was growing in Ukraine and it's just hitting on the Russian balance sheet by the way they draw the borders nowadays, who knows? But, you know, the big thing is, is that they had a big crop and it's allowed them to do like a massive export program. And that program continues today with still sort of like an aggressive tail. Going forward, the Russians themselves and people who are well suited in Russia are talking about an 83 to 85 million ton crop there. So if you take their number of 104, call it, you know, we're talking about, you know, almost a 20% decline. And, uh, you know, if you 
you know, if you just add it all up and you'd say that probably their ability to export in 23, 24 will not be that it, what, what it was in 22, 23. And I think that bodes very well for, for Canada with the smaller Russian production, a smaller Ukrainian production, a uh, very short crop in Argentina that just happened. There'll be a long tail from Australia, but Australia is kind of staring down the barrel of going into an El Nino. The last time they had an El Nino, their production was 15 million tons. I'm not saying it's going to be 15 million tons in 23, 24. Remember, we're talking about their crop that will be planted and, and you know, harvested sort of in uh, in November. Um you know, but it's probably not going to be in the, you know, 35 million plus tons. So I think from a Canadian perspective, you know, wheat market in 23, 24, it looks like it's going to be, uh, you know, there's going to be strong demand for Canadian wheat. And we might have an export program that, you know, we haven't really seen in the past, like like more wheat than, than we've uh, shipped in, in uh, you know, many years. We'll have more of Lindsay's conversation with Neil Townsend of Grain Fox right after this quick break. You're listening to Real Ag on the Weekend. Want to get the best out of your soybean crops? Whether you've been growing them for a generation or are just starting into soybeans, find what you need to know at soybeanschool.com. You'll see videos on growing tips, pest control, and much more from specialists across the region all in one place easy for you to access from your desktop, tablet, or mobile phone. Maximize your yields by staying up to date with the Soybean School, presented by BASF, Pride Seeds, and Syngenta Canada. Before you get back in the field this year, spend some time with the Corn School on realagriculture.com. Get all the information you need on hybrid selection, planting depth, crop inputs, and more from a wide range of industry experts. A massive library of video content is available on demand when you need it most. Spend your time outside of the field, inside the classroom, with The Corn School on realagriculture.com. And welcome back to Real Ag on the Weekend. We've been listening to Neil Townsend of Grain Fox explain to Lindsay Smith of Real Agriculture the overall grain and oil seed complex. Let's hear the rest of what Neil has to say. You can kind of sometimes you can win by being the the, the smallest loser, yes. right? So, you know, when <laughs> yeah. we set the prices for grains and oil seeds, like we really have to pay attention to what's happening in the United States with the corn and the soybean yield. So, like if the corn gets that one eighty one point five, which was the USDA outlook number. I mean, you know, all of the grains and oil seeds prices are going to struggle because that's going to reset the market because, you know, that would probably project for, you know, the U.S. having a ending stocks so at 2.5 billion bushels or above. And we haven't seen that in a considerable amount of time. The last time we saw it, we, we had corn, like, you know, fighting to be about $4. Okay. So definitely sort of the, that cautious optimism then and, and so much hanging on that. So we'll, we'll talk about that as well. I just want to very quickly hit on... Um, well, oats, <laughs> the sad story of oats. So tell us that sad story, Neil. Yeah, I mean, oats is just one that we, you know, we, we like, oats is almost a tragedy because there was so much hope in oats. And like, we saw this, like, you know, developing marketplace in the United States, and it was going to be this wonder food and, and a lot of expansion, and it was going to capture, you know, most of the shelf space for non-dairy alternatives and those kinds of things. And I, I guess that, you know, that's, there but it's not with the growth patterns that people expected so there hasn't been as much uh you know demand and then the thing is we grew a lot of oats in anticipation of a very strong market and so what's happened was we didn't sell as many oats more oats are out there prices have really you know scaled back quite a bit and uh you know the oat prices for new crop they're showing a little sign of life like because people are worried like we have the acres down you know 35%. Thirty-five percent. I've heard people having them down as much as fifty or even sixty percent. I, I that, that might be hard to believe, but I mean that's the sort of pessimism that's out there about oats right now. Well, and oat acres can swing pretty substantially. Like thirty-five percent sounds like a lot, but they, it, it can. I mean, maybe less so in the in the most recent time period, but um, it is definitely one of those crops that can. Just quickly. Um, a lot of talk, of course, about pulses, specifically peas. Uh, we have seen, uh, you know significant amount of investment in Western Canada into processing peas. Uh, but that is another story of sort of the the food factor, the domestic versus ex- 
passport. What are we seeing for, let's just stick to peas. We don't have enough time to go over all the pulses, but if we can talk peas briefly, what's the outlook there? Well, I mean, the outlook's actually pretty good. Uh, just because, you know, we do see a back off in P acres, a loss of about 10% acres year on year. Um, that's a lot of that's to do with sort of like dissatisfaction from an agronomic point of view, not so much. And the marketing isn't being, being great. I mean, I, I think like there's, you know, yellow pea bids out there for new crop right now, and those haven't been very strong. Uh, so that's not encouraging any more acres. And sort of the tonality of those bids has also been, you know, pretty negative. Like, oh, you know, if you don't take it now, this will be the best of the season. So if the best, if that's the message to a farmer and he's saying the best of the season is in an attractive price, well, that doesn't exactly tell them to plant it. But, you know, with smaller acres and, and uh, you know, a tight supply to end the year. Now, the sort of negative about uh, yellow peas, green peas are pretty good, frankly. We've got a lot of markets for green peas and they tend to be, you know, pretty steady markets. And if one sort of drops off a bit, another couple come in and buy them. So green peas, I'm more optimistic about Yellow peas, the big question mark is just like, how much will we send to China? Because mm-hmm. China was our, you know, our big purchaser. They've sort of backed off a bit, not using as much in the feed. And, you know, they're getting closer and closer to Russia. You know, we haven't talked about the war too much, but, you know, the war is going on and President Xi is visiting in Russia and, and you know, they're getting all the phytosanitary approvals they need to ship products from Russia into into China. And one of those things could be yellow peas. And, and again, that's just sort of, adding up to maybe more difficult for us to be as much of a bulk shipper of yellow peas to to China going forward. I mean, never say never because there's been a lot of positive uh, indications out of China recently about seed grain demand. It hasn't quite got to yellow peas, but something that was just dead, dead, double dead, triple dead all year was uh, sorghum demand from, from China. And that's not a Canadian crop, but all of a sudden, you know, about three or four weeks ago, they bought like 2 million tons of sorghum, right? So it, totally changed that market, put it, you know, put it on its head, right? And now you can't even get really like, you know, it's uh, to get a price for sorghum, it's you have to make a phone call because, uh, you know, they're worried about the supply and demand uh, and the balance sheets in the U.S. And, and there seems to be, again, you know, more Chinese demand. So maybe that will happen for yellow peas. It hasn't happened yet, but, you know, never say never. But in the meantime, smaller acres next year uh, tightens up the supply and demand balance. So potentially, you know, second half of the marketing year next year, we could see yellow peas uh, kind of um, show some price strength. That was Neil Townsend of Grain Fox talking to Real Agriculture's Lindsay Smith. You know, the the one thing's for sure, you know, as I talk to growers and I hear from market analysts, oat acres, definitely down. <laughs> That's the one given when we look at Western Canadian acreages, oat acres. Down. I was talking to a large oat grower this week and yeah big time cutbacks for sure uh seed growers i've talked to that are selling oat seed definitely talking about volumes being lower you know one of the real wild cards i think when it comes to the rotation like think about saskatchewan specifically one of the big wild cards long term is solving the affinomyces problem if, if we can't solve that affinomyces pro, pro, uh, problem in say peas in the relatively short term it's it's going to really hurt acreages um, and, and so what backfills that and how do we solve that that problem? It's it's a big, big discussion that's happening very much in the industry and at the individual farm level. There is no doubt we could see some real shifting. And we talked about the Canola Council, talking about 25 million acres of canola by 2030, really focused on that brown soil zone. That's going at, that's going after not only some of the Durham acre, but also going after that that pulse acre as well. So uh, I, I guess an acreage battle is can be good for farmers because that means there's some there's some options but we'll see how it all plays out over the long term if you have any feedback on today's program i'd love to hear from you send me an email s haney at realagriculture.com you can also uh, call the real ag feedback line 855-776-6147 send me that feedback thanks everybody for getting real and getting connected with real ag on the weekend talk to you next week cheers everybody